thyroid deficiency syndrome. Can you please elaborate on this? Sure. Um, okay, let me start off by giving my speech that I always give, but I'm not a doctor, and this isn't medical advice. Um, the idea of an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome, I'm sure other people have come up with that. I'm trying to popularize it as a concept, but again, that's my pet theory. It's not a recognized syndrome as of yet. Um, let me back up a little bit. So a lot of people in our community are very frustrated with doctors, and I, I feel like that frustration is at least in part justified because the medical community has been so woefully blind to the healing properties of this plant that it's, it's hard not to get frustrated with them. That said, the, you know, medical science is a branch of science and I have a profound amount of respect for science. And I feel like the, the problem that we're facing is that doctors are taught one type of scientific discipline and it's not a particularly helpful type in terms of plant medicine. Now, doctors are taught to think like chemists, and I, I love chemists. So, you know, half our channel is just breaking down the chemistry of this plant. So, you know, chemistry is great, but the way chemistry works is typically chemically isolating specific chemicals and then studying them one at a time. And that's interesting, and it's led to a whole bunch of medical breakthroughs but it's, it's not the only way of doing things. And there's, there's a lot of different scientific disciplines that take profoundly different approaches to problem solving. And that's the essence of what science is supposed to be. It's supposed to be getting at the truth. If you're using a tool to get at the truth and it's not working, you need to switch tools. You don't just ignore something. It's the, you know, a good scientist pursues answers until they get them. And if one tool isn't working, you need to switch to another one. Now, what I think, is needed in terms of in terms of investigating this plant is to think more like a wildlife biologist and a wildlife biologist goes out into the field and they observe and they what you know what they're observing is essentially the interaction between organisms though so, you know they'll study one fish eating one type of bug or one fish eating another creature and you know, a monkey swinging in the trees and what is it doing? And that, you know, it's, it's all anecdotal by definition. And how we've learned so much about animal behavior, animal diet, animal husbandry is largely based on gathering anecdotal information to a point where it's statistically significant. You can start to make inferences about future animal behavior based on past animal behavior. Now, if you're just in that headspace when you investigate cannabinoids, it changes how you perceive everything. And that, that I think is what's necessary. Now, if you're thinking like a wildlife biologist and you're looking at the interaction between one organism, a special needs child, and another organism, a plant, a cannabis plant, an, an alternate explanation on what we're actually looking at is immediately apparent. It's actually pretty classic wildlife biology. And what, it, what I believe we're look, dealing with is a dietary deficiency. I think the cannabis plant is part of the human's natural diet. And all of these diseases that appear to be miraculously cured by cannabis, that's, that's backwards. It's not that they're cured by cannabis, it's that a lack of endocannabinoids are actually the cause of all these diseases. And that's why I call it a syndrome, an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. And like any dietary deficiency, that can manifest in a wide variety of ways, and it's not it's not just a lack of endocannabinoids causes cancer. I actually believe that, but it can manifest in a lot of things. If you have risk factors that make it likely that you're going to get cancer, a lack of endocannabinoids greatly exacerbates that risk. And if you have a healthy amount of cannabinoids in your diet, you greatly diminish that risk almost to the point where it's not there. Same is true with most diseases that cannabis appears to treat. I don't believe, I mean, it is treating it but not the way people are thinking. They've got it backwards. It's we've removed a plant from our diet that was has been in our diet throughout human history. It's we evolved to need this plant. And that's how we developed an internal communication system in our brains that uses the same chemicals found in this plant. And a lot of the illnesses, like take epilepsy for instance. Epilepsy can be caused by all kinds of things. It doesn't, you know, it can be a chemical exposure, it can be a brain injury, it can be a brain malformation. There's a lot of things that cause epilepsy and we don't fully understand it. 
but we've known for thousands of years that cannabis stops seizures. It's some of the earliest medical texts are using cannabis to stop seizures. And that's, you know, a classic dietary deficiency. That's if we, if we stop thinking about it like a medicine and start thinking about it like a food, it changes the whole notion of how we approach it. And you, you would never demand a clinical trial for a food product. A food product, we don't use that standard. And it's not that we're not being scientific about it, it's that food is not treated the same way as medicine. Now, the line between food and medicine is actually quite blurry. And a lot of medicines are really foods, and a lot of foods are really medicines. They're not, it's not as cut and dry, but the way medical science approaches a medicine is very different than the way a wildlife biologist approaches foods. And for, for a long time, we sucked at keeping animals alive in zoos. Like for, you know, a hundred years ago, a carnivore would, wouldn't live very long in a zoo. And it, you know, it took wildlife biologists going out into the field and carefully observing what their dietary requirements were before we were able to keep them alive. And I feel like the same thing has happened with humans with this drug war. I think we systematically removed plants from our diet that had always been there. And, you know, it's taken a long time for all the ramifications of that to show up. But all these horrible diseases that are now commonplace wouldn't be commonplace if this was just in our diet. And the solution that Western medicine wants us to pursue is to chemically isolate some specific cannabinoids and put them in pill form and then give it to people as they develop these illnesses. And I don't think it's a coincidence that that is how they're going to make the most money, but in terms of how we approach it as a society, that's completely backwards. This is a plant that belongs in our food supply. And if we just allow it to be in the food supply, take away these ridiculous rules and just have people consuming non-psychoactive cannabinoid acids on a daily basis, I truly believe it would radically reduce the amount of MS, cancer, a whole bunch of different autoimmune disorders, epilepsy, but, you know, the sky is the limit because we're as a society, we're experiencing an enormous dietary deficiency because we're not getting cannabinoids. Okay. Yeah, so what you're saying is treat it more like a vitamin preventative type Exactly, okay. exactly. Like if you, I think cannabinoids are going to be treated as a dietary essential like down the road. Like you take vitamin C, vitamin, and then... Exactly. Yeah, I mean, think about, exactly. Okay. Like, think of, like think about scurvy for a yeah. while. You know, when people used to do these long... Um, voyages across the ocean, they would often arrive with amazing vitamin deficiencies. And they, you know, would seek out these foods that cured scurvy. And all it was was like vitamin C, like cranberries. Yeah. It's just, you know, and imagine if we had systematically removed all sources of vitamin C from our diet. And just everyone's having all these different health problems. People are going blind, their teeth are falling out. Just, you know, like you remove vitamins from the diet, it's going to manifest in a wide variety of ways. And people that are predisposed to certain illnesses are much more likely to get them if they're experiencing these amazing dietary deficiencies. Now imagine you roll up with a plant like, you know, an orange tree and just suddenly you're bringing orange juice to it. It's, you know, in the moment, everyone's going to think that you're a miracle worker because all these horrible d diseases that they weren't sure how to treat are being treated by your magical plant. But really, it's not that the orange tree is some magical plant. It's that you've needed a, a aspect of your diet that you haven't been getting. And as soon as it's introduced, it, you know, problems are being solved. But it, you know, it's just a backwards interpretation to think that it's curing the illnesses. It's, you know, it's a deficiency that we've introduced into our culture through the drug war.